Okay, so welcome to calculus. Last time we were talking about, we had be just begun talking about um, extrema. So today is going to be all about extrema, finding optimal points of functions. So this is section 9.3. Extrema. <clears throat> so a definition of stationary point so in calculus one The functions that you uh, deal with, their plots can be drawn on a plane. So does this particular thing that I drew, does it have any stationary points? Yes. Yes. Uh, where, how many and where are they? Two. There's two of them, right? There and there. And at the top and the bottom of those um, hills and valleys. So what, what is the geometric condition for, for, having a, for being a stationary point? What's the geometric condition? Right, it, you have a tangent, and that tangent is slope zero. So a horizontal tangent. So that's the, the geometric condition, the geometric condition, the thing you can look at with your eye. The function becomes flat there. The tangent becomes flat there, horizontal. So what is the analytic condition? That is to say, the equation that, that, makes, that defines what a stationary point is. It's not that x is 0. The derivative at that, at that position is 0. So that's what it means for a point to be stationary in the calculus one sense. <clears throat> okay, so now in the calculus two sense, suppose now we have a function of two variables, f of x and y. So now, a function of two variables, it no longer makes sense to say the derivative, because that's ambiguous. Why is that ambiguous? Yeah, because this function has two partials, one for each uh, variable. So <clears throat> here's an example of a function. Uh, a, a calculus 2 function. I'm trying to evoke the idea of like a sombrero type of thing here. Okay, so this function has, notice that it has a maximum at the top. Okay. So what is, what is the um, geometric condition for, for this point right here, this stationary point. So just like I asked, what's the geometric condition for this being a stationary point? How did you respond? It's flat, right? As a horizontal tangent. A horizontal tangent line. What's true for this one? A horizontal tangent plane. <clears throat> So again, it's horizontal tangency. Horizontal tangency. What is the analytic condition for this? So by analytic, I mean what, what equations must be true? Yes. So it must be the case 
that the x partial is 0 and also the y partial is 0. <clears throat> so the x partial being 0, that means that in the x direction, you're not, your, your slope is 0. You're not going up or down. So that means that in the x direction, the tilt of the plane is flat. And the y partial being 0, that means that in the y direction, the tilt of the, of the plane is also flat. So if, it's, if the tangent plane exists and it's flat in the x direction and flat in the y direction, that means that it's flat. It's horizontal. So this is the definition of a stationary point okay, in, in the case of two variables. Now, if you had a function of 10 variables, what would need to be true? All 10 partials have to be 0. If it was a million variables, all million of them have to be 0. Okay. <clears throat> so another thing from... Uh, to recall from calculus one is the thing that we're going to uh, generalize on the next page and that is the second from calculus one the second derivative test to classify stationary points Okay, the second derivative test to classify stationary points is the following. So suppose <clears throat> that you have a little piece of function that looks like this. And because we're looking at it with our eyes, we can see, oh, well, that's a maximum. And we have a, another little piece that looks like this. And because we're looking at it with our eyes, we can see, oh, that's a minimum. Okay. Both of these functions have a stationary point this one at the top, this one at the bottom. And by stationary point, ge geometrically, I mean there's a horizontal tangent. So notice, in particular, that being stationary is not enough to, di to discern, to distinguish between max and min. You can't tell just from stationarity-ness. <laughs> So, in this case, we have that the first derivative is 0, and in this case, also the first derivative is 0. However, using the second derivative, you can distinguish between these now. You can distinguish between these. Uh, what's going to be true about the second derivative for this one? So imagine in your mind's eye that that this is a that this is a a face. Oh, it's going to be negative. It's going to it's going to be negative, right? Yeah. So so this is a frowny face, and those are negative people, right? I suppose. So then the the second derivative here must be negative. And similarly, how about for this one? positive. Because that's a smiley face with a bow tie or something. I'm not sure what's going on there. So if you have a stationary point, that's supposed to be greater than. that should say greater than. Thank you. So if you have a stationary point and the derivative is negative, then that is certainly a maximum, a, rel a local maximum. If you have a stationary point and the second derivative is positive, that is a local minimum. What if you have a stationary point and the second derivative is zero? Not necessarily. Then it's just you have no information. So my, que my question to you is, so, so these, these two are the cases when, when students think of the second derivative test, usually they just remember these. Okay. 
but there's there's other possibilities, and that is that <coughs> this function could could be say a minimum, but it, the function could get really flat at the bottom. For example, so not like a normal parabola, but it's really really flat there, and this is is a minimum, and there is a stationary point here. But it, be, it becomes too flat. So this is, for example, a case where the first derivative is 0 and the second derivative is also 0. So what that's telling you is that the second derivative is not able to make a conclusion about this. So you, can't, you don't know what's happening here. Another possibility, a, a function that does this, in case you're incredulous, is x to 4. x to 4 does this. It's too flat at its stationary point for the second derivative to be able to figure it out. Uh, another, another case is something like this. So this has a stationary point. But again, this, even though this one is minimal, this one is neither, right? It's neither minimal nor maximal. It's neither one. So this is another case where you have a stationary point and the second derivative is zero. So in this case, when the second derivative is zero, you have no information. And therefore, you can make no conclusion. So the only time you can actually make a conclusion is when the derivative, the second derivative is, is non-zero. It's negative or it's positive. You have, you have a question? Picky. Okay. Back to your top example. Yes. Where, this one? Yeah, right there in the middle. Yes. The, the one in the middle? Well. The, this point of inflection? Yeah. Uh, so to, to draw it, to draw a more exaggerated, so as an aside here. <clears throat> okay, so there's, I think there's, there's two separate questions. One question is, is this a point of inflection? So is it? Yes. yes. Okay, now, <clears throat> At this point of inflection, would you please draw the tangent line? How, how does the tangent line appear? Right, it, it does this, right? It goes like this and like this. So I have a question. Is, does this point represent a stationary point? No, it doesn't. Why does it not represent a stationary point? It's not that. So, so what is the, either one, what is the geometric, I'll ask, what is the geometric condition for a stationary point? No, we don't like that one. How about what is the analytic condition for a stationary point? That the, the derivative is zero. So derivative is zero. Is the derivative zero here? No, it's not. What's true about the derivative here? It's negative. Why is the derivative negative here? It's sloping down. Because the tangent line is sloping down. The geometric condition for, for, for a stationary point is that the tangent must be horizontal. So is this horizontal? It's not. So this is not a stationary point. Now, what, now it is a point of inflection. And the analytic condition and what I suspect what I suspect is where, where, the, where the hiccup came is that this is a place where the second derivative is zero. Right? The stationary points are places where the first derivative is zero. Other questions? <clears throat> This one? Yeah, so the second derivative, are those second derivative of zero? The, the second derivative, that should say C. Okay. 
Well, okay. It 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 does say zero. I mean, yes, it, is. <laughs> it, it does say zero. <laughs> Let me just change them all to zero. Then it makes sense. So. So these are these are examples of why when the second derivative is zero, you have no information. So for the function x cubed, the first derivative is zero at zero, and the second derivative is zero at zero. And also that is true for x to four. So the so what I'm saying in these two cases is that when the second derivative is zero, that means you can make no conclusion. You can only make a conclusion when the second derivative is positive or when the second derivative is negative. So now, what we need to do is we need to turn this into an analogous test for functions of two variables. But it's going to be a little bit more entertaining and interesting, and the reason is that, well, consider the second derivative test for functions of one variable. How many, how many first derivatives are, are there for functions of one variable? One. one. How many second derivatives? One. one. So now, what if we're dealing with functions of two variables? How many first partials? Two. two. How many second partials? Four. Four. Ah, so we have so many more derivatives to deal with now. So we want to have we want to be able to make an analogous second derivative test for functions of two variables. Okay? <clears throat> so here we go. So this is called the second partials test, usually denoted with just 2PT. So the second partials test. To classify stationary points. Okay, so let, let f of x and y be a function. Such that, okay, we've got a couple conditions. <coughs> Such that condition one, the point a, b, is a stationary point of f. So what does that mean, by the way, the analytic condition for, to be a stationary point? If that's the geometric condition. What, what derivative? What first derivative? Right, both partials. So that means that that means that the x partial evaluated at a b is zero, and the y partial evaluated at a b is zero. Okay. Furthermore. <coughs> Point AB is contained in a circle which is itself, or which is also contained. in the domain of f. 
Okay, so that's a bit of a technical point, so I have to sort of draw to describe what it is that I mean. <clears throat> so So f is a function of two variables. Its domain is some subset of the xy plane. So it's some, it's some puddle in the xy plane. So that means that uh, you can evaluate f for xy points that are in here but not out of here. So here's such a point. And what? What this condition is saying is that this point must be in the middle, essentially. So this, this green point that I've selected has the property that I can draw a circle around it. And notice that that circle is entirely within, it's entirely within the set. OK? <clears throat> so so this, is, this is good. This is the case I'm talking about. And to make it clear, I'll show you what I'm not talking about. Here's the domain of f. So how about this? Is that the kind of thing I'm talking about? No, not this. Why not this? It's outside the domain, so that's not going to work. Okay, so that one's obvious. But there's, there's another more subtle way that this can fail. So there's, there's a way that this can fail by putting a point which is in the domain, but nevertheless, so what do you mean? So, so what it is is that, is that it, it can work for any circle, right? The point is contained in a circle, so that means the circle can be, if it's on the edge, if it's yes, if it's on the edge. So notice that if you put it on the edge here, like this, anywhere on the boundary, then that's still in that's still in the domain. It's still part of it. But the problem is, is no matter how small you draw a circle, no matter how small you make it, so here's a pretty small circle. No matter how small you make that circle, you're getting that's that circle is not contained entirely inside. So this isn't gonna work. Not these kind. So I'm talking about this kind. Ones that are in the middle. <clears throat> so any question about the conditions? Uh, we need, actually, we need one more condition, and that, that is that 3, all second partials of f are defined at each point in the circle. Okay, so if all of these things are true, then we're going to define define ends with an e we're going to define capital D is f x x evaluated at a b multiplied by f y y evaluated at a b minus f 
xy evaluated at ab multiplied by fyx evaluated at ab. So notably, I'd like to point out how many, how many second partials does a function have? Does, does f have? Four. Notice that in the definition of big D, we used all of them. Right? So we're using all four of them. Now, big D in, in normal circumstances, in circumstances which are normal for this class, uh, can actually be simplified a little bit. How can big, big D be simplified a little bit? Not, not minus twice, but mi it's not twice. Squared, right? You can square this one because these two are the, these mixed ones are the same under normal circumstances in this class. So this is xx ab yy at ab minus xy at AB squared. No, because they're supposed to be the same. <clears throat> okay, so then since, since we're requiring the second partials to be defined everywhere, uh, then D there's only three possibilities. D is either negative, zero, or positive, and that's all that there can possibly be. So we're going to make a table of all the possibilities. One possibility is that D could be negative. So if D is negative, if D is negative, then this stationary point that we found and that we evaluated this D at is, represents a saddle point. It's going to have it's going to have 3 but one of them is going to be broken into 2 so there's kind of 4 <clears throat> So one case the next case is that d could be 0 Okay this is analogous to the case where you had no information so you have no information so you can make no conclusion What's the last possibility for D? D could be positive. So the positive case is broken into two subcases. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, when D is positive, it may be the case that the uh, xx partial is negative. So now I want you to imagine, back in calculus one, when functions had just one variable, when you were at a stationary point that had negative concavity, Okay, and negative people, are they smiling or frowning? Wow. Frowning, so it's concave Down. downing, right? So, so if you're at a stationary point with negative concavity, where are you? Max. At a maximum. And that's, that's the conclusion here.
So this is a local max. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the last possibility is that the xx partial is positive. And so again, in, in the calculus one reckoning, what it, in calculus one, if you were at a stationary point that had positive concavity, then where were you? At a minimum. Okay, so now to help you navigate this, this table of possibilities. Um, so when D is zero, that's the same as before. You just can't make a conclusion. When D is, when D is uh, negative, what that actually means is imagine that you're you know, traveling on this surface and you're, say, traveling that way. Notice when you're going this way, like you're going through the mountain pass, is that path that you're on in the calculus one sense, is it concave down or concave up? Down. It's down when you, travel, when you travel over the mountain pass. But what if you travel in the other direction like this? What is the, your concavity? Up. So what I want you to observe about a saddle is that the concavity that you measure depends on the direction that you're traveling. Right? So then in this direction of travel, in this direction of travel, you're concave down, and in the other direction, concave up. So this, this case, when D is negative, this is called the inconsistent case. because the concavity is inconsistent. It's not always positive or, or always negative. This case, so I'd like for you to imagine, now you're traveling up a mountain that's <laughs> shaped like this. Notice that no matter how you travel, when you travel across the stationary point at the top, it's always concave what? It's always concave down, right? It's always concave down. No matter if you're going into the page, parallel to the page, it's always concave down, no matter how you measure. And similarly, for this one, it's always what? It's always concave up. So the case when D is positive, this is referred to as the consistent case. <clears throat> so when D is negative, you have inconsistent concavity, such a thing is called a saddle. When D is positive, you have consistent concavity. It's always concave up or it is always concave down. So a further measurement is necessary to distinguish between them. Okay, good. Any question about the statement of the second partials test? <clears throat> okay, so now let's, let's actually uh, do it. <clears throat> So for example, <clears throat> so for example, find and classify <clears throat> all stationary points. with the second partials test. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so here's the function. 
f of x and y is 6x squared plus 6y squared. plus 6xy plus 36x minus 5. <clears throat> so find and classify all stationary points with the second partials test. So what's the first order of business? Find the domain. Okay, that's good. So let's find the domain. No, let, let's not. I'm going to avoid that. Okay, well. I'm going to avoid it because it's. Is it messy? It's not messy. It's just, it's just there's a large swath of mathematics that's being omitted from, from this course because it's not a scientific calculus course, mm -hmm. and to to properly answer that question, the question of domain. At any rate, I'm avoiding it. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Which also means that I'm not going to ask you. Good deal. So okay, we're avoiding that question. So, besides that, what's the first order of business? First yeah. what, why would we want to find the first partials? Um, so because what? It's not that. You can't find the second partial without finding the first partial. Okay. But what are, we, what are we doing? I mean... These ones, right? The stationary points. Right? It says find and classify the stationary points. So the first thing we have to do is find the stationary points, right? That's the first thing. So let's find the stationary points. Now, would someone please remind me, what's the geometric condition for a stationary point? That's the analytic condition. Horizontal tangent, plane. Horizontal tangent. Both, both are important and necessary. So we're looking for places where the function becomes flat, where, where, the, where the tangent plane becomes flat. So you ask us, like, what is the analytic, or, just, or, or there's just no both in that equation? I'm never going to get the right answer for some reason. Like, I'm always going to give them backwards. Do you want No, I don't care if you. Okay, that's good. It, so g g geometric means, like, picture. Okay. <clears throat> I just want everyone to be able to think about a problem from a, vi from a visual point of view, like with pictures, and from a writing point of view, like with equations. You like pictures better. Well, so it may not be true to say that, that for everyone, someone likes one more than the other. Sometimes it's, it's better to say, you dislike one less than the other. Okay, that's fine. Everyone has a preference. And by preference, I mean, it, that may mean least dislike. Okay, <clears throat> I lost track of what we were doing. Oh, stationary the stationary points. points. So to do that, we'll need the first partials. So I claim that by now, you should just be able to read off the first partials for me. What are they? 12x, and then plus 0, and then plus 6y, plus 36, plus 0. Okay? The y partial, what is this? 0 plus 12y, plus 6x, and then that's it. So we found the partials. What are we supposed to do with these partials now? We have to solve for one of the variables. Okay. <clears throat> Something like that. Is that we have, to, we have to solve that both partials are equal to zero. So it's a system of equations. The thing we don't like. Okay, so 12x <laughs> plus 6y plus 36 is zero and 12y plus 6x is 0. So we need both of them to be 0 at the same time. <clears throat> OK. So what's the general strategy for this? Take one of them and solve it. 
Right. So we want to solve for a variable, either variable, from either equation. So just using your intuition, have a look at both equations and try to imagine which variable from which equation would be easiest for me to solve for. What do you think? Second. The second one, the second equation, and we're going to solve for x. x. Okay. So I'll, I'll write down the second equation, and I want to I want to ask why why did you choose to solve for x? Who would not get a fraction? Okay, to avoid to avoid fractions, right? <laughs> We have fraction anxiety. That's fine. You could have you could have solved for for hate. fraction well, like, fraction hate. Yeah, okay. Like <laughs> so you could solve for y. Y is negative half x. There, there's nothing wrong with that. Right, but x is negative two y. That's pretty. Or x is negative two y. So either half or two. Okay. So then x is negative 2y. OK, so we did that. So specifically what we did is we did this. We took the second equation, and then we started working on it. And we got to here. And what are we going to do with this information? Yeah, we're going to take this, this information and put it back into the first one. <clears throat> OK. So I'll copy the first one down here. 12x plus 6y plus 36 is 0. And specifically, we're taking this negative 2y and putting it into this x. <clears throat> so 12 multiplied by negative 2y plus 6y plus 36 is 0. Now, this looks not so excellent, maybe. But what, what achievement have we made? We've eliminated a variable now. Now this equation only has one variable. So negative 24y plus 6y plus 36 is 0. So negative 18y plus 36 is 0. So 36 is 18y. And what's the conclusion? Y is 2. <clears throat> is, this the, is this a stationary point? No. Right. It's not even a point. So it certainly isn't a, isn't a stationary one. So why, so very clearly now, why is why, why is y equal to two not a point? Because you need x. Yeah, because points are points in the plane x y. So this is not a point. So how do we figure out what the point is? <laughs> yeah, plug plug this in to say this one here. X is negative two y. <clears throat> so then in that case, x is negative 2y, so x is negative 4. <clears throat> so now I'm going to write something good. So the stationary point is 2 comma negative 4. No. Well, 2 comma negative 4. No? no? Why not? Right. So, so points are x, y points, right? So what error have I made here? I, I wrote y, x. Okay, I just I bring this up because I've graded so many of these where a student has done exactly this. So does everybody see that the error that I made is this? This error is is particularly quite common when you solve for y first. Because since we solved for y first, you know, student kind of maybe is primed, psychologically primed, to write the 2 first. Did you have a question? Well, when you're putting a line through instead of the x and the number, it makes it look like they're like highlighted and then a line goes over them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's important. Okay, okay. Let me, um, yeah, I'll put an X through it. Like that? Better? Okay. <clears throat> so that's wrong. Uh, and this one is right. Okay, so this function has just one stationary point. <clears throat> Have we answered the question? No. no, we haven't answered the question. What was the question? <laughs> Yeah, so we did find all stationary points. That is all of them. Ah, we didn't classify it, right? We didn't classify it. So now we're going to classify but in particular we're going to classify with the second partials. So now the first thing we need to do is find all the second partials. <clears throat> So xx, what's the xx partial? 12. So it's constant. That's pretty nice. What's the yy partial? Also 12. That's a coincidence. What's the xy partial? OK, right, because xy means compute the y partial of the x partial, the y partial of the x partial. So that's 6. And so now that fyx, I'm going to go ahead and compute that too, and I get, uh, I get 10. No. <laughs> now I got 10, right? So why is this certainly not, not right? They don't one five. Yeah, the mixed partials. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, there's no 10. and there's just no 10 anywhere. Okay. So the mixed partials, the mixed partials xy and yx, they need to be the same. They need to be the same. So if you were to get to this position uh, on an exercise, then you'd know, oh, I, I made some error somewhere. And you need to go back and double check. Okay, yeah. Yes, the mixed ones must be equal. It is, it is only a coincidence that these two are equal. So now let's classify our stationary point. <clears throat> so D is going to be XX at negative 4, 2, YY at negative 4, 2, minus xy at negative 4, 2 squared. Ran out of space there. OK, so then what is xx at negative 4, 2? 12. 12. It's 12 everywhere. What about what is yy at negative 4, 2? Also 12. Okay, then minus. What is xy at negative 4, 2? 6. So this would be 6 squared. So that'd be 144 minus 36. And I don't know what that number is, but it doesn't matter. It's well, positive. Because it's positive. That's the only thing that matters. So what does that mean? About this, about this stationary point. It's a min. It doesn't mean it's a min. It does not mean it's a min. It means that the concavity is consistent. It means that it. It means that the concavity is either always up, or it is always down. So yes, in a sense, this means it's not a saddle. It means that it is a maximum or a minimum. So this, this means this is the consistent case. Will we need to label it as such? No. But it may help you <laughs> to do that. This is the consistent case, which means that it is either a min or a max. 
However, yet we don't know which one it is. So how do we how do we figure out which one it is? Yes, into xx. So xx evaluated at negative 4, 2. What is it? It's 12. And what is significant about 12? That it's positive. So now at this position, we can conclude what? That it's a min. It's a, it's a local min. So therefore, the point negative 4, 2 is a local min. Um, yeah, you did, it, you did it up here, yeah. Uh, ha however, I'll say this. Very, very often, I observe students get, provide answers where they conclude that D is positive and they get a false memory about this from Calculus 1 and they think positive always means yeah. men, ex except these were both negative, right? And it, it turns out to be a maximizer. Okay? Any question about this one? <clears throat> yes, negative 4, 2 is a local min. This is the only stationary point and this is its classification. <clears throat> so now we're going to do a, a lot of them because these are so enjoyable. So same instructions. Find and classify all stationary points. with the second partials test. Okay, and the function is f of x and y is 9xy minus x cubed minus y cubed minus 6. Okay, so what's the first order of business? Stationary. Stationary points. And since repetition is the first rule of teaching, well, I guess correctness is the first rule of teaching, and then after correctness, repetition is, is a good rule. Uh, what does it mean? What is the geometric condition for a stationary point? Horizontal tangent plane. What is the analytic condition? All, all the partials are zero. Okay. So what's the x partial? 9y minus 3x squared, and then the y partial, very good, so we found the partials, what do we do with them now? Yes, we need to solve a system, 9y minus 3x squared, equal to zero at the same time as 9x minus 3y squared is zero. <coughs> so the general strategy is, again, you, you, <laughs> yes, you, you take either equation and solve for either variable and plug it into the other equation. Okay, <clears throat> so 
There's one thing that can't be avoided on this particular exercise. What, what cannot be avoided? Fractions. You, you can avoid square roots, actually. Yeah, by making a fraction. But you're going to have to do fractions, right? And I, I would strongly encourage you to avoid square roots. Because when any time radicals come in, um, you start having lots of possibilities. For example, um, for example, if, if, if you came to the equation, say, x squared is equal to, to 16, and you use radicals, then how many solutions do you have now? Two, right? You have two different ones. So using radicals makes, ca causes a lot of branching. So it's good to avoid them. So uh, which equation do we want to use? The first one. The first one, okay. So I'll use the first one. The second one, using the second one would have been just fine. So now I'm going to solve for a variable. And because I just got finished saying let's avoid radicals, what, what variable are we going to solve for? Let's solve for y. Okay, so the 9y is 3x squared. So then y is a third x squared. <clears throat> okay, what, what do we do with this? Yeah, plug it in the other one. So then 9x minus 3y squared is 0. I'm going to take this bit, a third x squared, and put it into that y. <clears throat> so 9x minus 3 uh, okay, so now I'm going to write something. So one third x squared equal to zero, like that. It's squared. It, I did. It's squared. No, no, the whole thing. One third x squared. This thing is squared. No, with the fraction. With the fraction. Okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> so What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's all of y is being squared. So so all of this is being squared. Okay, then doing that. So that's nine x minus three, and then one third squared is one ninth, and then x squared squared is x to 4 equal to 0. So 9x minus a third x to 4 is 0. And then we can actually get rid of the fractions now. How do we get rid of the fractions? By 3, right? If we multiply the equation by 3, everything by 3, then this would be 27x minus x to 4 is 0. Good old 0. 3 times 0 is 0. <coughs> so what about this? OK, so that's wrong. So I'm going I'm to write what I think you did. And it, I'm, I'm glad that you said it because many students are, w w you know, during lecture when there's nothing to lose. So many students are going, to, are going to attempt this. They'll do this and say, oh, I get it. Now I'll divide both sides by x and obtain something that looks like 27 is x cubed. Now this first step. As, as far as correctness is concerned, this is correct, but when I'm reading this as a grader, I'm 
already looking like this, like, uh-oh, something, something bad is, <laughs> is about to happen. Yeah, and then I get here, and then, oh, this is sad. This is, this is no good. So what, what happened right here? So why is this not correct? Why is this line not correct? Let me ask this. What did you do to get from, the, from, from this line to that line? Divided by X. And what is the, what is the cardinal thing that you must not do in algebra? You cannot divide by... You can divide by one. There's nothing wrong with that. What can you not divide by? Zero. Zero. So have a look at this, have a look at, at, at this equation that I say is incorrect. Is it true if you plug in zero? No. No, because it reads 27 equal to zero. That's not true. Look at the one immediately above it. Is it true if you plug in zero? Yes. It is true. It is true. So that's the reason why this step from here to here is wrong. However, for, for whatever reason, students are very likely to make this error. Okay? So you might wonder, well, what is it that you're supposed to do instead? So don't proceed in this way. Rather, when you're trying to solve equations, Really, the best place to be is where you are right here, when you have something something equal to zero. So to copy it back up here. Yes, what did you say? Yes. Do that. So 27 minus x cubed times x is equal to zero. This is how, this is the best way to proceed by factoring it out. So you, now you have a product of things is equal to zero. So what must be true about one of these? One of them has to be zero. So 27 minus x cubed is zero or x is zero. So notice that in doing this, in factoring instead of devising, we didn't, instead of dividing, we didn't lose track of this. So then as for this other equation, 27 is x cubed or x is 0. And then what is the solution to 27 is x cubed? 3. So x is 3 or x is 0. So are these the stationary points? No. <laughs> He's going to ask it every time. <laughs> so. So this is not the stationary point, okay, because this is not a point. How do we figure out what the stationary points are? Yeah, plug them into here now. So now I'll use y is a third x squared to obtain that x is 3. And if you plug x is 3 into here, what do you get? You get 9 over 3 is 3. The other possibility is that x is 0. And if you plug 0 into here, what do you get? 0. So the stationary points are 3, 3, and 0, 0. Have we answered the question? No, right? Because we have yet to classify them. <clears throat> In order to classify them, we will need uh, what? The second. the second partials. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's continue. So then what do we do? F, X, X. So what is the xx partial? Negative 6x. Negative 6x. 
Gesundheit. And what is the yy partial? Negative 6y. Negative 6y. And the xy partial? Is 9. And the yx partial? <laughs> Not even going to do it. Well, it's, it's a good idea to do it. Because, you know, I mean, if you were interested. <laughs> well, I'll just note this, that computing a, computing a partial takes probably 10 or 15 seconds. Not a lot of time. So <clears throat> let's classify. Which one do you want to do first? Okay, let's do 0, 0 first. So then D uh, would be the XX partial at 0, 0 multiplied by the YY partial at 0, 0 minus the XY partial at 0, 0 squared. So what's the XX partial at 0? It is 0. It doesn't matter what the other one is, right? Because <laughs> we're going to multiply it by 0. But it's 0 also. And then minus, what's the xy partial at 0, 0? Nine. 9. So minus 9 squared. And I don't have any idea what that value is, but only one thing matters about it. It's negative. So d is negative. What does that mean? It's a saddle that this, this stationary point is a saddle. So 0, 0 is a saddle. <clears throat> so the concavity that you measure, the, the SIGN of the concavity that you measure depends on which direction you travel. In some directions it is concave down. In other directions, it is concave up. A saddle. Any question about classifying zero, zero? <clears throat> okay, let's classify three, three. So now the classifier is xx at 3, 3, yy at 3, 3, minus f of xy at 3, 3, squared. So what's xx at 3, 3? Not 18. Negative 18. And the, other, the next one is also negative 18. And then, <clears throat> what is xy at 3, 3? Still 9, right? And then, the negatives cancel. 18 squared is 324. 9 squared is 81. The difference of those is positive. So what does that mean? It means that the concavity is consistent. So that means that it's always concave up or it is always concave down, which means that this is a maximum or a minimum. So how do we further distinguish which one it is? Yes, we use one of the unmixed partials, xx, for example, at 3, 3. So what is the x what is xx at 3 3 negative 18 So we measured d to be positive which means the concavity is consistent and in the x dire direction we measured down which means it's always down like a frown <laughs> right. So then what is this It's a local maximum So 3 3 is a local Max. OK. 
Okay, any question about this one? <clears throat> Aren't they fun to do this? <laughs> We have different definitions of fun. Well, to, to be honest with you, this is, to me anyway, just, just as a matter of taste, this is incredibly boring. But that's because I'm kind of a picture person. So when I do something that's analytic like that, like the only fun part that I have in that whole exercise is drawing that. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Right? <clears throat> Nevertheless, it's a, being able to do it analytically is a skill. Okay, how about one more? What time is it? Lots of time. So let's do, <clears throat> let's do one more of these. Let's go to the next thing. Uh, it's even more. The next one is even more fun. <laughs> it's it's more interesting to me. The next section. Uh, I mean, are we behind? Do we need to catch up? No, <laughs> we're, we're pretty much right on track. threading the needle. <laughs> okay. We could just stop after this, actually. Nah. No. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm going to read this out loud first, just so we get the general idea. A company is developing a new soft drink. The cost to produce a batch of this drink is given by this function of two variables, x and y, where x is the sugar and y is the amount of flavor. Okay, so you take so much sugar, so much flavory goodness, and it's a function of x and y, and we want to minimize the cost. <laughs> Because who cares what it tastes like? <laughs> we, just, we just want to minimize the cost. Okay, so does everybody get the general idea? Okay. <clears throat> I can't believe this. Okay, so we're going to do it. <clears throat> okay. So we have a cost function. cost function c of x and y and it's given by 2200 uh, plus 27 x cubed minus 72 x y plus 8 y squared and the instruction again is the same. Find and classify all stationary points. Okay, what's the first order of business? Yeah, find the stationary points. So on this exercise, because it is a cost function, because it's a cost function, you really ought to expect what to happen. What kind of thing in, in, in business, in economics, are you trying to do with cost functions? You're trying to minimize them, right? So if this is a, you know, assuming that, assuming that it's a properly phrased, informed question, you should expect a minimizer to occur. It would be, re I, I hope that you would be really surprised that if I gave you a cost function to optimize, that it didn't, it didn't end up having a minimizer. Okay. <clears throat> So let's find the stationary points. <clears throat> uh, so the x partial is uh, what? 81 x squared. Um, then what? 
yeah, minus 72 y, uh, and that's it. So then C y, would be negative 72x uh, plus 16y. OK. <clears throat> so find the stationary points. Uh, that means we found both partials, and we need to find when both partials are 0. So 81x squared minus 72y is 0 at the same time as negative 72x plus 16y is 0. So what do you think? Which variable do you want to solve for, et cetera? Control for y in the second equation. OK. So we'll solve for y in the second equation. Yes. Why do you want to do that? Sorry? Which one's You can solve for either one of them. Uh, one reason why you might want to not, not solve for x is that if you did, if you did, and it turned out to have some sort of ugly fraction in front of it, then you'd have to square that fraction, right, eventually. So you, you could sort of, if you think ahead a little bit, you can kind of avoid, um, avoid things like that. So my recommendation, instead of solving for x and potentially squaring something that's icky, let's solve for y and, and not square. Okay, so then 16y is 72x. And so, of course, 72 is not divisible by 16. But they're both divisible by 8. So that's good. So y is what? 9 halves x? Okay, now what? Put it back into the first one, right? <clears throat> so 81x squared, um, 81x squared minus 72y is 0. And we're going to take that y. Plug it in there. So 81x squared minus 72 times 9 halves x. OK, then what's 9 halves x times 72? 324. OK, so then 81x squared minus 324x is 0. So now again, you might be tempted to divide both sides by x, but that would be a mistake because that would be a division by 0. Ra rather, you should factor. So what's, what's the greatest common factor? So x is common. You could factor out an x. But is there a common divisor between 81 and 324? 81, right? <laughs> so 81x multiplied by x minus 4 is 0. OK, so then now I, from here I claim you can just tell me that the x's, which satisfy. What are they? x is 0, and x is 4. And then. Are these the critical points? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, right. We have to find have to find the other ones. So y is zero 
and for 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 that one, and y is what for the other one? Uh, Eighteen. Yeah. So the critical points are the stationary points are zero zero and four eighteen. Any question about um, finding the stationary points? Okay, so now let's classify them with the second partials. So since we're going to classify them with the second partials, we'll need them. So the XX partial is 162X. The YY partial, 16. The XY partial is what? Negative 72. And the YX partial, <coughs> negative 72. So that's good. I found the same thing twice. So now classify. So we'll classify 0, 0. So that would be x exit 0, 0, y, y at 0, 0, minus x, y at 0, 0 squared. So what's x exit 0, 0? 0. And y, y at 0, 0? 16, not that that matters, because we're going to multiply it by 0. And then minus n negative 72 squared. OK, and what's the only thing that's significant about that? that it's negative. So D is negative, so what's the conclusion? Zero, zero is a saddle. Yes, zero, zero is a saddle. <clears throat> so we found a saddle. By the way, on many kinds of cost functions and things like that, saddle points are kind of weird. But the weirdness, I claim, should be a little bit expected for the point zero, zero. After all, what were x and y? What, what kind of thing were we making? I didn't write it down because it was irrelevant, but you might have remembered me talking about it. Soda. And what were x and y? Sugar and flavor. Sugar and flavor. What, what's weird about the point zero, zero from the point of view of making a soft drink with X amount of sugar and Y amount of flavor? There has to be some in there. <laughs> yeah, this is water, okay? <laughs> it's what this is. It's water. It doesn't cost <laughs> Well, it does cost. It costs 2200 wh whatever. I guess so, yeah. So... From a cost, so from a, from a cost function point of view, it, it's a little weird to get a saddle, but it's not so weird considering the fact that it occurred at, when we were using no ingredients. <laughs> okay, classify the other point. What was it, 418? Okay, now, just from a reasonableness point of view, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that we should know what's going to happen here. It's going to be consistent, and what else? It's going to be um, negative. Uh, a min, right? Right. It's going to be a min, and why, are we ex why is our expectation that it should be a min? Because it's, it's a cost function. Okay, good. So xx at 418, yy 
at 418 minus xy at 418 squared. OK, so xx at 418 is, OK, 162 times 4, <laughs> what, what you said. I agree. Uh, and then this at 418 is 16. And then minus negative 72 squared. OK, now I, I can't do that in my head. And it's, oh, but it's got to be, right? Because this is like 1,000. Yeah. So 162 times 4 times 1, 6 minus 72 squared. Yeah, so 5184. So that's the number. But what's the only thing important about that number? That it's positive. What does that tell us about what we found? It doesn't tell us it's a local min. It tells us that it is a local min or a local max. It's consistent. The concavity is either always up or it is always down. So we need to make a further measurement to see which, the case, which case it is. So at xx, so the xx partial is that big number, 1, 6, 2 times 4, which is positive. So we found that the concavity is always the same, and at this one place, it's positive. So it's always positive. So what have we found? A local min. Any question about this one? <laughs> so methods like this are, are used all the time in, in um, business and economic situations, like if you're an, an analyst. Not so much if you're selling hot dogs. But if you're, if you're you know, a financial analyst trying to do this kind of thing, you, it's totally reasonable for you to have a function of of um, many variables. And then you want to you find the stationary points of this function, and then you want to classify them. Uh, so you know, already this table, this table that we're looking at, just for two variables, it's a little interesting, right? Imagine if there was 200 variables. Ah, then it's really interesting. And, and it's totally doable, and it's done all of the time. I was like, aren't there computer programs that do this? Yes, it's done by computers. But the way that it works is that eventually some, some mathematician had to come by and say, well, how does this work? Why does it work? Under what circumstances does it work? And then a computer scientist has to come by and say, OK, well, the mathematician showed us how it worked, but it's so slow to do it this way. Can we find a faster way? And then eventually you use Microsoft Excel, right? <laughs> and then it just works. <laughs> Terrific. <clears throat> but, but then what happens is that the people who are using it, they're using it, and then it doesn't work. And then they're surprised, why is it not working? And then eventually they come back to a mathematician, and the mathematician says, well, because you're not satisfying the conditions <laughs> of the method to be working. <laughs> OK, good. Any questions before we move to the next thing? So now we're moving to a, even more. Um, so it's, it's, even, it's even a little more complicated. And it's a little more realistic um, of a problem. So now what we're going to solve is, is constrained optimization. So <clears throat> the previous problem was something like minimize the cost Minimize the cost of the cost function where x and y represent sugar and flavor. And it, and it could have been anywhere, 
right? Could have been no flavor, no sugar, could have been anything. Right, so then in real life, when you want to optimize something, you have some constraints, right? So something like minimize the cost function subject to the constraint that by, by weight, it can only be 20% sugar, right? <laughs> something like that at most. So another thing would be something like, okay, I want someone, I want to hire a contractor to build my dream house. And this is what I like the most. I like, I like kitchens better than bathrooms, and I, I, like, I like short hallways better than long hallways, and you can make all kinds of things. Okay, and then I want you to build my dream house for one and a half million dollars. You can't exceed that budget. And if the budget was infinite, then, then you could do anything, right? But you have a budget. So you want to do the best thing according to a constraint. Okay, so such a thing is called a constrained optimization problem. And the name for that is the title of section 9.4, which is called Lagrange Multipliers. So, Lagrange multipliers, that's a, that's a good name for it, I suppose, because that's what mathematicians call it, but it's kind of a bad name for it, honestly, in this course, because it, it, you may lose track of, of its purpose, and that is how to solve constrained optimization problems. to has a T in it, right? <laughs> yes. <sighs> okay. So, here we go. <clears throat> so, this proposition is called Lagrange multipliers. So suppose that we're given a function of two variables, f of x and y, to optimize. This function, f of x and y, is called the objective. So optimize is just a generic word which means minimize or maximize. So given a function f of x and y to optimize subject to g of x and y is equal to zero. So this is referred to as the constraint. We'll define the Lagrange function of this system So now big F is going to be a function. So the objective function is a function of two variables, x and y. The constraint 
function, the left, hand, the left hand side of the constraint equation is a function of two variables, x and y. The Lagrange function of the system will also have variables x and y, but it's going to have yet another variable, and that variable is a lambda. So lambda is a Greek letter, which is scary, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> we won't. Not, not today, anyway. So, so lambda is a Greek letter. What's its phonetic equivalent in, in English? L, right? Why do you suppose we're using, using a, phonetic, a letter that phonetically is L? The dude's name is Lagrange. Okay, that's why. Okay, it was made... <laughs> There, there, was a, there was a guy named Lagrange. He was a famous mathematician, physicist person in the, Fr in the French um, times when they were really flying high. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of math was done in continental Europe. So we're using lambda. Okay? And just to be clear, the way you write a lambda is like this. Okay, lambda looks like this. That's what I'm writing. Some people write them like this. But I think without the serif, it looks a little weird. <clears throat> okay, so the Lagrange function of this system is little f of x and y minus lambda g of x and y. G of X and Y. Huh? No. <laughs> so why do you suppose this is called Lagrange multipliers? Because we're multiplying by lambda. Because we're multiplying by lambda. It's just that, it's just that simple. <laughs> Mathematicians are notoriously bad at naming things, or good at naming things, right? Lagrange multiplier. <clears throat> okay. This is a function. Okay. Of how many variables? Three, Three variables. Uh, how many partials does it will big F have? Three. three. Because it is a function of three variables, it will have three first partials. Okay. Does that mean it has nine second partials? Uh, no, that means it has eight. Oh, okay. No, let's think about this. Second does it matter for second part. No, it, it has matter? six. Does right? it matter? No, it doesn't matter. The reason why it has, but the reason why it has, let's 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 make sure we all understand why. Okay. <laughs> Is that how many first partials will it have? Three. And it does have nine. You're right. And so then, so then, for the first one, you have three. Three. Okay. Good. Good. So it has nine second partials. But it but it doesn't matter. So define the Lagrangian of this system as blah, blah. And then I just, I'm totally lost now. So what am I doing? First partials. You have three first partials. Ah. <laughs> the, <clears throat> the stationary points. of big F are when all three first partials are zero, are solutions to F sub X of X, Y lambda is zero, F sub Y of X, Y lambda is zero, and f sub lambda of x, y lambda is zero. So formerly we were solving systems of two equations. Now we're going to solve systems of three equations. <laughs> what do you mean? This is, this is about it. So we're not going to get any more complicated than this, if that's your question. 
We're going to move to a different topic after this. So the stationary points of f are blah, blah, and the uh, solutions, solutions of the question find, uh, optimize the objective subject to the constraint. And, and this is the solutions of that, if any, because there need not be any solution. Right? The solutions of the question uh, are among the stationary points. of this system. <clears throat> so in this class, when I, uh, when I give you a question which requires the method of Lagrange multipliers, I'll, the questions, the, the exercises that I give you will always have a solution. And that's just for, for simplicity's, for expediency's sake, essentially. So in a scientific calculus course, the first thing you'd have to verify is that there actually is a solution at all. Okay, it's quite important to be able to confirm or deny the existence of a solution because otherwise you might spend days and weeks and months or, and even years trying to solve something that actually doesn't have a solution. And I can't even tell you the number of times in history that such a thing has occurred. So an example, a notable example, a funny example, I think, is, you know, pi, the number, the number pi. Um, there were, there were uh, folks for, you know, a long time, centuries, trying to figure out, oh, it's got to eventually repeat, right? Like any other, like most fractions that people were accustomed to. For centuries, people trying to figure out, oh, it's just... We've got it out to 500 places. We've got it out to 5,000 places. It's still not repeating yet. And then uh, when at the advent of modern mathematics, it was eventually shown that it never repeats. <laughs> right? so, and so at that point, I guess all the people who were trying to figure out when it repeats, they just stopped. stopped. <laughs> Or, or here, this is better, right? So you, you want to talk about the solutions to, to something. Uh, when you talk about something, you have to first make sure it exists. Because otherwise, anything that you say about it, a set of things, a set which contains nothing, is true. So for example, um, are you aware that UTD's uh, football team is undefeated? <laughs> We've never lost a game. We've, we've, ne we've never been in any games. Right? <laughs> it's also true to say that, that um, every game that UTD's football team has ever played has been a, a, a purple banana. That's, that's also true. Okay. So let's solve an exercise. <clears throat> so any question about this statement? <laughs> okay. So, uh, minimize minimize f of x and y is five x squared plus 6y squared minus xy subject to uh, subject to x plus 2y is 24. And 
this is using the method of Lagrange multipliers. So I have to add this last bit here. And the reason is because on some exercises, including this one that we're doing right now, there's actually a far easier way <laughs> to, <laughs> to you count it off? <laughs> well, if, if I don't say using the method of Lagrange multipliers, that means it's a free for all. Do, do, do whatever legitimate calculus you want. Yes. Okay. So the, the easiest way by far to solve this exercise is to solve for x, <laughs> plug it back in, and then algebraically simplify, and then you have a function of just y now. Now it's a function of a single variable. Now you use calculus 1 techniques. That's the easiest way. Because we're, we want to use the method of Lagrange multipliers. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the other thing is that I, is that we're starting out with an easy one. Yeah, and the later ones that we're going to do, it's go, it's going to not be possible. <laughs> we can stick with it. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so let's get to it. So let's make the let's make the um, the Lagrangian of the of the of the system. So what is the constraint, so what is the objective function, by the way? Yes, yeah, so f of x and y is 5x squared plus 6y squared minus xy. This is the objective. What is the constraint? Yes and no. Let me let me be more clear. What is the constraint function? F of x, y. So it it is typically called G. Okay, y minus twenty four. Correct. So this is the constraint function because if you look at the description of the, of the method, you have to have the constraint function equal to zero. So in order to get that to work out right, we'll move the 24 to the other side, and then you have it equal to zero. And then you might ask, um, well, could I have moved the other stuff to the other side? Maybe I want to do that. And that, that would work just as well. Okay, so then that being the case, what is the what is the um, Lagrange function? Big F. Big F of x, y, and what? Lambda. Lambda. So what's lambda? It's a variable. Just like just asking what is lambda is just like asking what is x. Okay, so is it given? No. So I'm asking you to minimize this. Okay. So your answer will be something like f is minif minimized when x, y is, is um, 7, 12. So you're, you're finding it. So in, in addition to that, you want to find lambda. Oh, oh okay. We're finding lambda. I yeah. OK, so what is it? What, what is, what is the, the formula for big F? Yes, 5x squared plus 6y squared minus xy, and then what? Minus yes. X plus yes. So it's, it's the objective minus a multiple of the constraint. Objective minus a multiple of the constraint. So now, while we ponder this, 
We're going to multiply this out and collect, and then we're going to compute the partials. How many partials will there be? Three, because there's three variables, x, y, and lambda. So now what's happening here is that this is a, this is a very common strategy in, in, in mathematics, is that we have a function of, of two variables. Little f is a function of two variables. And we have one constraint. And what the Lagrange function does what the Lagrangian function does is it says, well, I'm going to trade the constraint for a variable. So instead of solving a problem with two, con with two variables and one constraint, I'm going to solve a problem with three variables and no constraints. Okay, so then generally speaking, it's quite common in more advanced problems to, to have something like a function of ten variables with five constraints. So you could, you could instead solve a problem with, with zero constraints and 15 variables, okay, and, and anything in between. Okay, so you're, you're trading a constraint for a variable. So does everyone see the, the trade? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just letting you know that, that that's the way it, it, it goes generally. Okay. <clears throat> So x, y, and lambda, and then this would be 5x squared plus 6y squared minus xy, and then minus lambda x. Uh, what happened there? That's two. That should be a that should be a y. Uh, minus 2y. lambda, I guess, and then minus 24 lambda. Okay, so then let's compute the partials. That's a plus. Yes, that's a plus. Thank you. Sorry, my attention is wandering. <laughs> okay, so then what is the x partial? Yes? Minus lambda. Okay, what is the y partial? Oh man, my wrist is killing me. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's like some nights I can do it without it, but I must be doing something weird, holding my body funny or something. Take, take some time off. <laughs> uh, so 12y minus x minus 2y. No, minus 2 lambda. So then the lambda partial is yes, negative x. Yes. Plus 24. Good. OK. So any question about finding the Lagrange function and its three partials? OK. What do we want to do with it? Yeah, we need to we need to solve a system of equations. Yes, I mean, on, honestly, problems like problems like this were solved by hand for a long time, but as far as I'm concerned, this is why we organized ourselves into societies <laughs> so we could make machines. Here. So, so the, lamp, the, the y partial of this is 0 plus 12y minus x 
plus minus zero, minus two lambda, plus zero. <clears throat> so twelve y minus x minus two lambda, and then negative x minus two y plus twenty four equals zero. Okay, now it's going to be just like before except now instead of having two equations and two variables we have three equations and three variables so it's a little more involved. However, the previous heuristic was that take any equation and solve for any variable and just among all the possibilities choose the easiest. Okay, that was the previous heuristic. Here the heuristic is going to be choose whatever equation is easiest to solve for lambda for. So now the heuristic is solve for lambda first. Okay. Why would we solve for lambda first? Why would we not solve the equation that only has two variables first? The reason, the reason is because. No, they, so the, the last one only has two, the other two have three. I do agree with that. Okay. But this, the solution to this system is going to have three variables, is going to have three numbers Correct. x, y, and lambda. Now, which numbers are we interested in? X and Y only. So in this class anyway, we're not interested in lambda. So if we solve for lambda first, that means we will determine its value last, which means that when it comes to determining lambda, we can just stop. Okay. So for example, on this, on, on this one, yes. notice that we, so we found out X is so here we solved for y. That was what we did initially on the previous exercise. Uh -huh. Then we substituted in to eliminate y and found x. And then we resubstituted back to get y. So the fact that we solved for y first means that we determined its value last. So what I'm telling you is that in the method of Lagrange multipliers, because we don't care about lambda, solve for lambda first, then when it, then you never have to determine the value of lambda because we don't care about it. Now, and, and I'll preface that by saying in our class. So in, in, if you go on to get a more advanced economic degree or something like in like operations or something like that, they, the method of Lagrange multipliers is used a great deal and in some of those cases, the, the value of the, of the multiplier is important because sometimes, you know, it, it may only make sense for you to have a positive multiplier or it may only make sense for you to have a negative multiplier. But in our class, we don't care. Okay, so then we'll solve for lambda first. Which equation seems easiest to solve for lambda? First one, okay. So 10x minus y minus lambda is 0. <clears throat> so then 10x minus y is lambda. Now what can we do with that lambda? Yeah, now we can take this one and put it where? Second the second equation. By the way, why would you not want to put it into the first equation? Because that's what we just saw from ETN. Yeah, because that would not do anything. <laughs> okay, so then 12y minus x minus 2 lambda is 0. So taking that. there. That would be 12y minus x minus 2. 10x minus y is 0. And now that looks bad, but what have we accomplished? Just two yeah, no more lambda, just two variables. So 12y minus x minus 
20x plus 2y is 0. <coughs> and then I guess I'll continue up here or something. So then simplifying that, um, 14y minus 21x is 0. And so then what? 14y is 21x. So y is 3 halves x. Okay, now what? Now plug this into the third equation. <coughs> so then negative x minus 2y plus 24 is 0. <coughs> so negative x minus 2, 3 halves x plus 24 is 0. So 2 times 3 halves is 3, so that's uh, 3x's and minus another one, so negative 4x plus 24 is 0. So what's x? 6. <clears throat> okay, so is that the answer? Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> He's going to ask it every time. Okay, so, so no, that's not the answer. How do we figure out the answer? Okay, good. So now we can take this and start back substituting. So this, say, into this one. So that would give us y is 9. And then now we could, if we wished, to plug it back in to get lambda, if that was just something you were interested in. Maybe at some later date you'd be interested in it. But in our, in our class, we're not interested. So because of what... Because of what I said, uh, I said that every, every uh, question that I give you is going to have an answer. So the fact that I said minimize this f, and the fact that I said that the optimal points must occur at the, at the, critical, point, at the critical points, the stationary points, that means that here's the, the only stationary point. This must be where the minimizer is. Stationary point is at 6, 9. So then now, what, what is the minimum value? Yes. So into the, the objective? Into the objective. So the minimum <coughs> uh, occurs at 6, 9 and has value. Uh, so we just need to plug that in now. So that's uh, 5 times 6 squared plus 6 times 9 squared minus 6 times 9. 612. You know, so on a on a word problem, say, you know, this might be something like um, the objective function is cost and, and x is the number of widgets and y is the number of what's its. It's a which function? Is it going back into? The objective, the f. So it might be something like, you know, maybe it's in hundreds of widgets and what's its. So at the minimum occurs at, the minimum cost occurs at 600 widgets and 900 what's its for a cost of $612 million or something like that. Okay, good. Any question about this? So on Lagrange, you have to find still the stationary points, and then you also have to plug it into the objective. 
into the objective. Could there be more than one stationary Yes, there could definitely be more than one. <clears throat> so I, so I could, in, in fact, I'll just tell you that it's my intention to give you questions where there's more than one. So what if, what if I gave you a function, or what if I gave you a system, a setup, and I said minimize Minimize f according to this constraint, and you found, and you found three stationary points. Then what would you do? Plug it. Yes, plug it in three times, and then whichever one is the smallest, that one is the minimum. Right. So I could give you, you know, I I would never do it, but I could, I could give you a question like, you know, where there's a hundred stationary points. And then you plug in a hundred times, and then you find the smallest one. <clears throat> yeah, there. Really, what we've been doing for the past like, two weeks is just going through the steps, but there's a lot of steps. Yeah, I mean it, it's tedious. I, I'm fully, I get it. It takes a long time. I, I'm with it. Yeah, and I agree that it would, it would be unreasonable for me to put three of these on a quiz <laughs> and, and give you 30 minutes, right? It, would, it wouldn't work. Yeah, I get it. <clears throat> it, would, it, it must be exactly the same. Okay, so what, what I mean is that no matter what order you do it in, as long as you proceed correctly, you will get six and nine. So if, if you happen to solve for x first, that'd be just fine. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay, so that's it. We're getting out five minutes early. Yay! Okay. The best. <laughs> Have a good weekend. <laughs>